Am I allowed to use the word fan wank? No. Uh, you just did. What is it? Uh, well, it's called a uh, randomizer, and it's fitted to the guidance systems and operates under a very complex scientific principle called potluck. Now, no one knows where we're going. Not even the Black Guardian. Not even us. Hello, and welcome to episode 15 of the Randomizer podcast. I'm Tim. I'm Charles. I'm Alistair Mills. Welcome. Yeah, very special guest. Our old friend Ali Mills has joined us. Let's sort of ask Ali as our guest, what's your kind of sort of overall feeling on the Chibna leader? Because that's what we've largely been discussing in terms of Doctor Who and you who. I should do a spoiler warning first, actually. So spoilers for all Doctor Who up to and including Revolution of the Daleks. And um, we will also be talking about Red Dwarf, but that's quite old. So if you haven't seen it by now, then go and watch it, then come back. Um, We'd probably touch on the Tomorrow People as well. But Hmm. yeah, so Ali... um, Jodie's Doctor, 13th Doctor, Chris Chibnall era. Chris Chibnall. Okay. Do you want the honest answer? Oh, <laughs> yes, definitely. Be, try and be constructive as you destroy his character. Do you remember the story Dinosaurs in the Spaceship? Yes. Mm, yeah. Did he write that? Yeah. So. Can I tell you what I dislike about that? And I think that will tell you what I think about Is the Is it the spaceship and the dinosaurs? I think... Sometimes modern Doctor Who, because it has such the facility to produce these amazing graphics and whatnot, and it just looks visually stunning. Mm. I think sometimes, and I think Chibnall's very, very, very guilty of this, I think sometimes he forgets about just the basics of storytelling. Uh, Harold Pinter, the famous playwright, talks about, you know, somebody asked him, why do you think your plays are so successful? And he says, well, thank you for saying that. But if, if, you, if you want me to give you an honest answer, I would say most plays, most television, films, radio plays are successful when you get two people in a room talking to each other. And what they're talking about is worth listening to. Mm. I remember watching the, the uh, Dinosaurs in the Spaceship and all I saw was this amazing sort of dinosaurs and fucking spaceships, and they, I thought, I, I, they were on a planet, weren't they? And then the zoom, I can't remember the ins and outs of the whole story, but and it, I, but I didn't pick up in a single word anybody was saying. It was just, it wasn't of interest to me. It wasn't, A, it wasn't interesting, and B, they had nothing to say which was of interest. And that includes David um, Bradley. He was in it, wasn't he? And he's a brilliant actor, but it looked stunning, but it had no substance. That is what Mm. I feel about Chibnall's era. I never seem to remember a line or engage. I'll take take that back, actually. Sometimes Graham would catch my attention because I think Bradley Walsh is a really good actor. I always got the feeling that he made shite dialogue sound better. I think Mm. think Chibnall's very good at the visual, but but the actual, Mm. what, what Russell T Davis was good at, was you listened to the characters and you were interested in them. People. Whereas I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't throw one famous quote or line at you from his era. I couldn't give you one. Mm-hmm. All right, flip it around. Um, what what have you enjoyed, you know, even if it's just this moment here, that monster there or anything? Uh, I liked the story Rosa. But again, this is going to sound a bit, not odd, but it was the music that got me for that. And that scene in the bus at the end. Mm. It was a popular pop song wasn't it yeah yeah it was and um yeah. and so therefore that could have been a, that could have been any drama about rosa with that song yeah. overlaid at the end and it got me crying but yeah i actually found the body in that boring mm. i found the, the whole space premise racist boring mm. i think he's good at the visual stuff i think he's very mm. good you should write a story but nobody has any dialogue <laughs> and it'll be it probably, it would probably actually be boring i What's totally that buffy episode that? where they can't talk yeah uh, talking I, about things, things I like. Um, I want to love Jodie. That's an interesting way to put it. That's an but <laughs> I don't love her doctor. I I find moments in Rosa, that scene in the hotel, do you remember the one where she's talking about Banksy? Do you remember that scene? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think she plays that kind of humour really well, but she shies away from mm-hmm. it too much. She doesn't, for me, her doctor doesn't have the the gravitas to engage me in whatever situation's going on, 
I just mm. feel it's all very facile and very lightweight. I don't feel the danger. For fuck's sake, the last story, no, it wasn't the last one, the one before the last one, had the master killing what I thought was one of the best characters in Doctor Who Full Stop. The Lone the, Cyberman. The, the mm. Lone, I thought he was brilliant. I thought yeah. this guy is going to be here for years. Yeah. This Same guy here. has got so much backstory, he mm. could end up... So, sometime in the future, the Doctor goes back in time, meets this guy as a normal sort of person before the cybernization and takes him on as companion. Big finish would have a field day with that character. Yeah. But mm. what, what happens? The Master shrinks him within about two minutes. He could still yeah. appear prior to that in his own timeline, I suppose. They could they still just, have that story. He, he just pissed that character up against the wall. And, yeah. um, no. and, then, and, then, and then, then what happens next? The, the Time Lords are now fucking dead. Cybermen. What? I've, I've got this mad theory about how we can get out of all this. This is how I would get out of it. Do you know how in Jodie Whittaker's first story, she falls out, no, twice, twice upon a time, she falls out the TARDIS, doesn't she? Yeah. yeah. I think I spoke to Shah about this. So basically mm-hmm. how you can escape from all this is basically she falls into a different dimension and she doesn't know she's there. So, They've already but, denied that one. But they, could, they can deny what they like. But they oh, yeah, they I can... know. They can lie. I mean, a new showrunner, like you say, can do what they want. I don't know whether they will or not. I personally hope it, but I think like the half human thing in the movie, best thing for the new show showrunner, completely ignore it and just, you know, do what they want. Because I don't yeah, think the only people that care about that is like the likes of us, you know? Whereas the public would just say, Oh for God's sake, I'm d I am i do not want you know all this. I just want a bit of fun. But Charles, don't you think that Moffat was such a fan that he had all these boxes that he wanted to tick as a fan. He wanted yeah. it for us to see um Eccleson's regeneration and he wanted to tie everything up, didn't he? And he did brilliantly. He was a writer that was good at visual but also good at the dialogue, but he was great at that, you know, timey wimey stuff. Mm. And I just think Chibnall struggles with certain areas of it. But I just think fans yeah. brought the show back. Russell T. Davis started it, brought it back. And I think our, our, our opinions are important. And, and I think, you know, if I would like them to tie it up in the way that it's not, I don't want a Bobby from Dallas moment, but what, I, what I'd love mm. is at the end of her stories, I just want it tied off nicely so that, in a sense, nothing that she did. It all happened, but it happened in a, in a, over the rainbow. It didn't yeah. happen here. And when, when we start the next Doctor, the next Doctor... And this universe will begin from uh, yeah. the end. Although saying that, you look at Matt Smith, the universe was destroyed about four times. And but see, all that, all that depends on whether, for example, Jodie was still the Doctor, but um, if Chris had left by that point or not. I don't necessarily think... I don't think he's a good enough writer to tie it all up neatly. And I think to the detriment of watching it and being entertained, I'd rather just be entertained at the moment rather than just getting bogged down. I understand that, you know, fans want this, but all fans want what isn't attainable sometimes. You know, like, yeah, Sunderland want to be, I don't know, whatever league they're in, champions, or somebody wants to make a book that's been deemed impossible to make as a film. It's just sometimes I don't, think that we're I think the aspirations can be slightly you know too much I would like to see it completed neatly but if it doesn't I'm just gonna forget about it and move on and try and enjoy you know the show as it is I I, I actually think he is a good writer all oh, um, right but what uh, well look at <laughs> well, uh, look at Broadchurch it's just amazing television so Chaz was saying the other yeah. day that um, he, he was surprised that, given the strength of Broadchurch, that uh, the Chibnall seems weaker in the Doctor Who writing he's done. And I think we both agreed that we think he's got great ideas, um, but doesn't do the resolutions of them particularly satisfactorily. Mm. For me, it's more that there's a kind of spectacle for spectacle's sake rather than um, having that kind of clever weaving of stuff and the depth of stuff that Moffat and Davis managed, you know. The other thing I think is he does other people's villains really well. I mean, I don't think they're great stories, but the two Dalek stories they've done have been quite good. He did the Cybermen really well, etc. But when he creates his own stuff, it's just a bit lacking, you know? And I don't think he... Let's say he's a great at the likes of uh, Broadchurch with drama, but heightened drama, which is basically what Doctor Who is, I don't think he can do. He's too steeped in real world 
for for fantasy yeah. sometimes. I think it's like Russell T Davis and um, and um, and Stephen Moffat have got the ability to, as you know, Doctor Who's got a time machine. It's a TARDIS, so every story can be so many things, anything, to any place. So therefore, I think you need a showrunner who has got that kind of um, access. To like Tim was just saying this amazing mm-hmm. ability to basically write so many different types of stories and then different types of uh, genre. Whereas I think Chibnall's good at the broad church, the, the 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 detective drama thing, very good at that. But he's proven himself less good at basically, you know, setting a story in the future in an alien planet mm-hmm. where a bunch of Daleks are. And, and um, I think he gets a bit, a little bit tied up and lost. A man is the sum of his memories, you know, a Time Lord even more so. So this is the part of the show where we have randomly selected uh, a Doctor Who story using the wonderful website, therandomizer.net. Um, so now we're basically, uh, Ali has been folded into this process and we have all three of us rewatched uh, Nightmare in Silver, the Matt Smith story featuring the da, da, Cybermen. Da. So I'm going to ask Ali to lead us off. And what did you think on, not presumably the first time you've seen it, but have you rewatched it much or often? Yeah, well... Um... When Chaz said that it was Nightmare in Silver, and he'll tell you this, I was like, oh, God, can we not do the demons or something? But it's Should have seen us when we got Time Lash. It's a randomizer. Because yeah. <laughs> you got Time Lash. Did you get Time We time got lash? Time Lash. And the space oh, yeah, part. I remember that. That was good, though. I know, it was great. It opened yeah. up debate. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. I nearly cried. Time. I nearly <laughs> cried because I was so happy. <laughs> Well, we're hoping for great things this week, you know. But um, no, well, I'll tell you what though. Um, so, first time I watched it, I didn't. I wouldn't say I hated it, but I think because Neil Gaiman had done, in my opinion, one of the all-time best Doctor Who stories, and the Doctor's Wife. I've what I've rewatched that story twenty times. I love that story, and mm. you know, what's the name of the actress who plays the TARDIS? She's amazing in it. She she would be a good. Doctor, but any road, when I heard he was doing the Cybermen, I was so excited because he's this kind of weird fantasy writer and and everything. And I thought, oh my god, this is going to be what is this going to? And then I heard they were rejigging the Cybermen and doing something new with them. And I, I was so made up and so excited about watching this. And when I did watch it, I was just disappointed. It was to me. Raises a question for me of to what extent do you think expectation plays a large role? This is partly why I try and avoid any kind of even mild spoilers, because um, I like going in cold to drama as a whole generally. Because, yeah, you're right, because this is what my point is that um, I'd built myself up because mm. his previous story was so good, and I, I, I thought this is going to be better, and, you know, Warwick Davis was in it, and it was just... And then I watched it, and it was just, oh... Outside Matt Smith's amazing performance in it, because I think he's brilliant in it, um, and Warwick Davis is brilliant. There's uh, individual brilliant performances, but it just left me cold. But, so I've never watched it since, until Chaz said this was the story, and I went back to it, and I have written some notes. And um, I've, 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 my, my first word is charming. I found it charming. Yeah. I actually loved it because it wasn't in the context of the series. I wasn't, I just, I'd forgotten most of it. I, I play a lot of chess. I'm an actor, but my, my non-acting job, I do two days to three days a week as a support worker. And I look after a young man who's had a brain injury. So I do night shift and sometimes he sleeps through. And so, I've, you know, yeah, you're watching television or reading the book. Well, 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 you know, checking him in the monitor and stuff. And uh, I've started playing a lot of online chess. Oh, we should play. Uh, yeah, I'll play. I'll give you a game. And uh, Gaiman must be a chess nut. Because that whole story, for me, it was just like a massive big game of chess, wasn't it, yeah. really? But what I got from it was also he must love Alice in Wonderland because that's what I, that's what I really got. He It was like mm. watching... I can't remember the name of the character, the guy that was kind of like challenged... Mad Hatter. Really, Mad Hatter, yeah. yeah. The tone was so fantastical. I thought, well, if you think about it, we shouldn't have been surprised by this because that's what he's known for. Mm. And all he gave us was what he's known for. But... Watching it again, there was little moments that made me really happy. And one of the soldiers at some point, the soldier shouts, um, there's reports that the weather controller is malfunctioning, causing storms, heat waves and snow. Moonbase mm. and Tomb of the Cybermen. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, and also Ice Warriors. He loves Doctor Who. It's really mm. cosy. 
Matt Smith is a sort of cyber planner guy, so underplayed, so yeah. chilling. Could you see Jody doing that? That 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 kind of sort of where where you're thinking the doctor has he been taken over? What's going on? You know, the cyber mates, they were brilliant. What a brilliant idea. At the time, I wasn't that into them, but actually, great use of modern technology. And it harked back as well. In some ways, actually, this is going to sound crazy. Do you guys think, I thought, in some ways, this makes me think of Dalek. I was actually saying when uh, Tim and I were watching it, I was a bit disappointed when the Legion of Cybermen turned up because until then it was Dalek. You know, yeah. you one Cyberman doing all the making all the problems. You had exactly the same moment of coming into the room and there's the enemy revealed. With yeah, the Cybermen yeah. uncovered. Yeah, the other. I mean, the other thing is it's interesting what you say about rewatching it and feeling charming. I mean, I I found it on first watch. I wasn't as impressed because probably I was sort of slightly biased to Doctor's Wife, but I did find it average, an average story at the time, and there was nothing wrong with that. And that's why, I, you know, sort of when you sort of hold it up against something that's, say, a hell of a lot more impressive. But it's also, as you were saying, rewatching it, it's something that we were discussing. Uh, a little while back about, you know, when we were saying about watching Time Lash, you watch it now without the investment of the the show at the time. At the time, it felt horrible because you felt that everybody was laughing at your show, whereas now you can watch it with that 20-year gap and just watch it with a drinking game or something. And we were saying, would the likes of Orphan 55, given a 10-year gap, that you know it's not important anymore. Would you just find it silly and no? And you're, stre- you're, stre- you're stretching it now, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no, come I know, on, but mate. you see, come you, on. I know, I know, but you no, see, I agree, thought, I agree. Uh, I've got a question for you guys. Which Cyberman story did the Cyberman never really speak in, and it and it worked better for it? Speak. Hmm. Was there invasion? Yeah. Do you know that the Cybermen hardly speak in Nightmare and Silver? Those, they, they, I think they don't even say delete. Neil Gaiman, Neil Gaiman is such a Doctor Who fan because what he's done is he's looked at Invasion and the Cyber Planner. It's such so clever that, yeah, he's planning, but he's planning against them as well. And I thought the end was charming, you know, with yeah, Warwick yeah. Davis and the president of the universe and everything. And actually, it made me think, you know what? I'm doing a Doctor Who watch a phone. I couldn't get by for Doomsday. I just couldn't get by it. I just... I stopped at episode two and I thought, I can't go on. But what watching Nightmare on Silver has given me is actually, do you know what? I should continue with it because it's been years since I saw a lot of these stories. I'm not a Sylvester McCoy fan, not at all, at all. In fact, I've only ever watched his stories once. And I thought, I was dreading reaching his era. And I thought, God, I'm getting on. Imagine I died and it was 56 or something, 57. And the last Doctor Who story I ever watched was fucking... Dragon the Rana. <laughs> yeah, and but it'd be like actually, rush me on your deathbed, rush me a copy of uh, horror <laughs> fang rock now. Yeah. I actually did really enjoy it a lot more than I expected to. Um I loved the whole bit with the you know like the aspirations to the Turk with the chess playing machine. Um the kids didn't annoy me. I mean I'll be honest, kids don't necessarily annoy me in Doctor Who that often. Warwick Davis was great fun. And uh, Matt Smith battling himself was was a joy to behold. It was enjoyable. I'd seen it very recently when it came up on the randomizer. Um, my partner and I are watching through the Matt Smith era. We only have the time of the Doctor to go. The one sort of odd note for me was the kind of oddness and suddenness of the marriage proposal at the end. And <laughs> yeah. I sort of looked out for any kind of seeding of that and didn't really yeah. see any. But you well, know, charming's a good word, a really good yeah, word for it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I said to you the other day when we were talking about the marriage proposal maybe it was a case of she was genuinely nice to him without knowing who he was can i ask you guys opinions on the cyberman that design i don't like the roundness of the faces but otherwise i think it's great i have no problem with it i don't think it's that bad i I suppose taking away the sort of cybers logo kind of helps a little bit Mm. but i don't have a great problem with it they're they're trickier than ever before maybe with the the head coming off and turning around and the detachable hand and stuff the the bit with the detachable hand reminds me of Evil Dead 2. There's a bit with the character Ash chops the hand off his oh, yeah. zombified girlfriend that jumps up and it sort of just uh, 
you know, uh, grabs him in the in the head. Managed to be lucky enough to get tickets to go to the 2013 proms, yeah. the Doctor yeah. Who proms. And mm-hmm. my kids were all, they all had little Weeping Angels t-shirts. They were all very young and it was fucking amazing and absolutely insane to be in that auditorium and to feel so proud of Doctor Who. But there was quite a lot of these Cybermen there, actors in those, in those costumes. And this is my, my story. Half time. And we go to the toilet, walk into the toilet, and there's a Cyberman doing a piss. Brilliant. <laughs> Love it. That's going to give you scars. That's the helmet. Healthy scars. I, mean, I get this. I, I was such a Doctor Who fan. I, oh, I wish I'd taken a photograph, but you know, you just can't. And what, what struck me was um, what a great costume it was. It was so well made. And it had real weight. But having mm. been, been stood next to one of these guys uh, as he was, you know, doing a piss. Could you go? Were you unable he, to go? He, he had his helmet on as well, I'm telling you. I thought it was supposed to be yetis that, that, that you found that, in the loo. That's a story I've never told. I would never have told it. I'd forgotten about it. But Nightmare you, and Silver made me remember. You heard it here last, folks. Go. Okay, so... I think any more comments on Nightmare and Silver? I think we all enjoyed the rewatch, maybe more yeah, than we expected. Very much. So um, I would say it's a virtuoso from Matt Smith of that sort of Jekyll and Hyde performance, mm. and that classic thing of you know, if you notice, he turns one way always to be the cyber planner and the other way to be the Doctor, and that's kind of clever physical device which suits Matt Smith down to a T. Um, when I give the word, press the button. The big one, yes. Maybe it works in conjunction with the others. Let's move on and select a new episode. And Ali, you're very welcome to kind of send us in your thoughts on this one by email if if you want to rewatch it. So I've loaded up the website, and let's. Click the randomizer button and choose another story. All right, well, let's try and find out. Now, what could it be? Vengeance on Varos. Oh, excellent. Oh, I am very oh, happy wow. about that. No, it's probably my favorite Colin Baker. Colin Baker is one of my favorite doctors, and it's simply because of Big Finish. Yeah, I would agree that Big Finish, he's definitely gone through that renaissance with Big Finish, and the, you know, they've helped his doctor establish himself. But I mean, Vengeance on Varos is a, is a really sort of interesting story because it's basically reality television taken to its logical conclusion in a sort of, well, in obviously a dystopian way, but I mean, Nigel Neal wrote um, a a play years ago called The Year of the Sex Olympics, and it was basically a reality TV show where they basically filmed people having sex and all this uh, to sort of like dullify the population, you know, they were basically just on drugs and watching this sort of crap just so that the totalitarian government could do what it wanted. And this is a sort of, uh, you know, obviously a sort of tamer version of that. You know, in the year of the Sex Olympics, they come up with uh, a show called The Real Life Show where people are on an island, but they basically throw in a serial killer onto the island. You know, so in a lot of ways, you know, you've got very strong parallels with this, and you know the the fact that their torture, you know, they they monetize their torture. You could basically see a sort of a despot regime doing something like this, you know, at some point in the future. But there's uh, a real world link there, actually. Because yeah. Remember Quiz? I've talked about it before. It was the play yeah. I worked on about the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire fraud. And in the West End version, I think it survived into the TV script as well. There was a scene, probably fictitious, but a scene with um, uh, John Demol, creator of um mm. Mark Briggs, I think, who created uh-huh. Survivor, and Paul Smith, who created Millionaire, all oh. comparing notes. And um, there's a kind of cheeky throwaway scene at the end where Mark Briggs says, oh, I'm just off to meet somebody. I've got a great new idea. You've done entertainment and you've done this and I'm going to do business and entertainment. And then we yeah. had a little scene of him going into Trump Towers. Yeah. Ah, yeah, and, you know, there's a thread between reality TV and... Absolutely. You know, I mean, Trump's well, we basically, power. we've spent the last four, uh, five years, whatever it is, it's time has been... felt like five. With, yeah, with a, with a reality TV president. You know, Nigel Neal, I mean, I've always said the man's a prophet. I think Mark Gator said they, they should have him on after the news. You know how they used to have the priest thought well, sack Mystic game. Meg and get him to yeah. do the lottery. And have Nigel Neal just saying, I told you so <laughs> all the time. <laughs> this is a really, it's possibly the best of the televised Bakers. Colin Bakers. Yeah. I think it's the one he likes the best as well. I think Colin Baker wasn't. A- overly happy with the, the choices that were made you know his doctor was yeah. basically he wasn't a nice 
person. Mm. And in that story, he's at his most nasty. Yeah. But mm. I think um, you can see his acting chops in that story. And actually, he's very Hartnell-like. Mm. Yeah, he's he's very the anti-hero. Because, I mean, when you watch, say, Twin Dilemma and the scene where he's strangling Perry, I don't like the story that much, but I think the performances in it are very strong. But the only, I think the only problem with the way Colin Baker was handled is that they kind of, they just didn't do it subtly enough with him. Whereas they took the same idea with Capaldi. He starts out all very, yeah. you know, and then he warms and suddenly becomes yeah. your avuncular yeah. uncle sort of thing. Yeah. Should we try and watch it together over Zoom at some point? We could all three yeah, of us, if we can right. schedule it. I'd quite yeah. like that. It'd be quite nice to revisit it. I haven't seen it for ages. When's the last no. time any of you watched it? Uh, I've not watched oh. it since it was on. Really? Wow. <laughs> Jesus, really? <laughs> no. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, re- I used to record the show on the VHS and, and, I, and I watched it immediately after it was on. I probably watched it three or four times at the time. Mm-hmm. Since yeah. then, I've not, went, I've not yeah. revisited it, no. I don't visit revisit Classic Who that much. That's why I kind of like doing the podcast, except that this randomizer, uh, of all the fucking episodes we've done, I think we've done two... Oh, this you is got all the shite ones out of the way. Classic <laughs> stories. We've only done two... This will be the second Colin Baker. Shall and I we've done the notes? Space Pirates, which I don't fucking count because I wanted to kill myself. Funny, I listened to a podcast at Radio Free Scarrow, an offshoot called The Memory Cheats, hmm. and... Um, and I, I enjoyed it. They, and they, they, their remit was they only did it 15 minute episodes. So they would do the randomizer, yeah, yeah. talk about it for 15 minutes. And, and some of the best episodes always were the ones that stories they didn't, they weren't looking forward to or disliked. Out uh, of 15 you know, random choices, this is only our fourth classic Who. Yeah. What was the other? Time one? the Rani, Space Pirates, and Time Lash. Oh, oh God, yeah. Time Space the Pirates, that must have, I, I remember you guys struggling that with that because there was not much to see. Mm. That was oh, we managed. That was it. Was character building, I think. Yeah. Um, so what's but, next? So having selected our random episode, we will go away and watch that and report back. I don't have a sonic screwdriver because I'm not off on a romp. I call it what it is. A great loss of pomp and circumstance. Now we are going to do a quick burst of romp or pomp. So Ali, um, oh. this is where I'll just click the randomizer a few times since we got it all fired up. Could I just interject on romp or pomp? I want to make a suggestion. Instead of romp or pomp, why don't we do grower or shower? Okay, (laughs) define your terms. Right. Basically, the idea, if you take Day of the Doctor, right, which is a shower, it's pomp, it's circumstance again, but it's like, it's fully formed. It's a story you watch and you immediately think, yeah, this is amazing. Whereas following that was Time of the Doctor, for example, which at the time when I watched it, I didn't dislike it in any way, but I thought, yeah, it's all right, it's all right. Every time I watch it, it gets better and better and better. I notice little things about it. Matt Smith, of course, wonderful performance. But there's a lovely scene in it where Clara helps him pull a cracker and then that's mirrored in the next Christmas special with Capaldi helping the elderly Clara do the same thing. So we I must say, I must say, guys, as an outside listener to your podcast, I like Romper Pomp. (laughs) <laughs> because yeah. I'll tell you why. Because um, most of the time you kind of, you know, you're talking. Sometimes you talk quite, you know, go quite heavy on things mm. and whatnot. And romper pop to me, it's almost like a little light relief. But that's uh, the point. I, 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 I quite. I, I also it makes me titter. You can titter at grower, Ali. We'll do both. <laughs> Let's do grow or shore first, and then we'll do some romping and pumping. Okay, so will I? Uh, oh, you've got the randomizer, so yeah. You know, okay, fine. I will. Select a random story, and then we'll go to Ali first, because he's your guest, and then Chaz for Grower or Shore. So, Ali, Attack of the Cybermen, Grower or Shore? Oh, I loved it the first time I saw it. So that's a so shore. It was an, it was an instantaneous yeah. thing for yeah. me. Chaz? Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Next chance. 42. Do we have a third option? Boar. Boar, yeah. I'll never watch it again unless you force me. Yeah. <laughs> the only interesting that. thing about that episode was the pub quiz. Well... <laughs> If we're talking about anticipation, I thought an episode that's called 42 had to be Douglas Adams heavy. And yeah, it was, yeah you would have yeah, thought. Yeah. So, uh, next one, The Waters of Mars. That's a oh, shower. Yeah, that's instantaneous. Yeah. Yeah. That should have been his regeneration story rather yeah. than that. 
pile of shite that they could used. Have been, you know, that could have been quite good. Plus, that's dark as hell. It ends on a suicide. Wouldn't have been amazing if if the, that story ended with the doctor, you know, just knocking three times, and basically the doctor gets infected and he's got to regenerate, save himself. Yeah. What a great ending that would have been. I'm on record as having said that he didn't milk his regeneration somewhat, I think, but, you know. He did a bit, but... Okay, moving on. Uh, a couple more of these. City of Death, sure. Sure. Oh. Yeah. I've abandoned our order with Allegoring first. I apologise, but um, <laughs> it's fine. Quick fire round. Last one of the growers or shores for now. The Impossible Astronaut and Day of the Moon. Uh, sure, for me. I loved that from the start. Yeah, the I think it is one of that. the most... Uh, visually beautiful Doctor yeah. Who stories uh, I've ever yeah. seen. The opening of that in the desert and everything, the colour was like yeah. screaming. Instantaneous at love. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So romp or pomp? Is this um, fun filled knockabout romp or more serious pomp and circumstance? Right. Go on then. Okay. Here we go. Twice upon a time. Oh, romp. Oh, it's a regeneration story, so it's yeah, quite serious it's, as well. But a little bit, but it's a, quite a good romp. I mean, it's very uh, funny. You know. I, th- I I think pomp myself. Yeah, I think this is the kind of World War One, you know. I won't, that was. I won't say my my opinions as such. I mean, I like the story very much, but yeah, it's I not a think... review; it's a hot take. Yeah, it, it just missed it. Was. It needed Susan. It, it should have been Susan, not. Um... I wanted more Ben and Polly. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, I I was more annoyed by the fact that um, yeah, yeah. sacrificed his regeneration story. Uh, you know, his Capaldi regeneration to keep the Christmas special sort, and then that fucking prick that's in charge now just uh, abandons the Christmas slot. But let's not get into that. Well, our light-hearted, fun-filled round is going very well so far. <laughs> let's do another one. Uh, the Faceless Ones. Oh, that's, come on, that's a romp, in it? Yeah, yeah. romp <laughs> about the airport. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. Doctor. <laughs> that's a definite romp. Yeah. yeah. Uh, image of the Fendal. We've had that mm. before, pomp, heavy. Mm. Serious atmosphere. Yeah, it's quite a heavy one, but it's a very. Story, it's a story. Thing. It's a story that we should love and revere, and but there's something about that story that doesn't quite. It doesn't have the the the. the it doesn't pull you in the way Talons or Horror, mm. Fang Rock or something like that, or even State of Decay. It should be, but it doesn't, and I've never quite worked out why. Make it two episodes then, and it will start to work. Glimpse of the Fendal. Right. One more, and we'll call it a. The girl who waited. That oh, is pomp. Pomp. I remember liking her at the time, but I've mm. never seen it since. Okay, it's heavy, so it's definitely pomp. But ironically, it's the source of our sound quote for the romp part. So never mind. That was romper pomp uh, in all its chaotic glory. Can I, can I throw three of my all-time favorite Doctor Who stories, and you can, you guys can say romper pomp? Okay. Right. Okay. The demons. Romp. Yeah. Romp. War games. Uh... Pomp. Pomp, but I'd say you could lose five episodes because they're romp. A lot of romp. I'd say rompy pompy. And the war machines. I like that story. Um, That's rompish. Yeah, slightly. Swinging. Okay, well done, folks. All these corridors look the same to me. The background to this section is that I've been re watching Doctor Who from the beginning, inspired by the books by uh, Rob Sherman and Toby Haydock um, called Running Through Corridors. And Reboss Operation is the start of the Key to Time season. The Doctor is given a mission to find and assemble the six segments of the Key to Time. And uh, a new assistant who is another Time Lord, uh, Romana, who that's a first to give him, maybe in the mold of Liz Shaw, I guess, who was a scientist as well and yeah. somewhat of an equal. But this is literally somebody who is one of his own people yep. and their initial relationship in Rebos is very combative, I would say. Mm. Yeah. So that's part of the joy of it, I think, is how they, I'm looking forward to the rest of the season, how their characters sort of soften down. But what do you guys remember of Rebos, Ali? On first viewing, I watched it as it came out live and um, I really liked Leila. I thought she was a great companion. I hated the way she left and I knew this new companion. I didn't know much about her. And I remember the, do you remember the trailer? Where the I think the black the white guardian was involved in the trailer, wasn't mm-hmm. it? The doctor yeah, landed yeah. in this weird void, remember? Yeah. And they did this special, yeah. And that was the first time she was in that. And I just yeah. remember fancying her and thinking, oh my god, she was in the scent. <laughs> she was. She was in the scent with Ian Ogilvy. She and, was uh, also in the Lightly Lads movie. She was in the Lightly Lads. I'm mm-hmm. thinking, oh, just like Tim, this is interesting. And she was a Time Lord, mm-hmm. and. Um, Oh, they don't really go on. I quite like that, and and the doctor was a little bit envious because she was a bit. She'd get better grades at the Time Lord Academy. And yeah, stuff like 
I did sort of start off that bit of sparring, which was rather fun, you know, watching her sort of, or him try to one-up each other when she had, like, uh, installed the the key time thing within the TARDIS, you know, what have you done to you, girl, and everything, you know, Tom getting all... Was that Robert Holmes? Was that Robert Holmes? Yeah. Yes. Robert Holmes, yes. brilliant at writing double acts. Yeah, yeah. No, and definitely. the Doctor and her man are a double act. Yeah, uh, and uh, the two warriors were a double act. Benro, one of the great characters in, in Doctor Who history, yeah. and, and that moment when he, he talks about realizing that there's a bigger universe, and yeah, that's Tom Baker played off him. You see Unstoff, who starts off as a kind of mm. cheeky chappy, um, you know, ne'er do well kind of gets softened and won over and really charmed by yeah. Binro's kind of, you know, Absolutely. and he's really he generous to Binro. He does, yeah. yeah. It's a it's a beautiful, beautiful scene. And as I say, Robert Holmes handles things so well. And getting to Ian Cuthbertson, I mean, is a is a Scottish, uh, an old school Scottish actor who was in many, many a sci fi fantasy series like Children of the Stones and uh, many a, and Budgie and uh, Charles Indale Esquire. Budgie, and, you wee bastard. Uh, yeah, I mean, all these things, but he's such a great, great actor. I mean, I oh, remember in, in Super Grand, he played the Scunner Campbell. But in this, him and Tom Baker are kind of matching wow. each other wow. point for point. And it's, you know, he's basically a space for daily in a lot of ways. And Ian but... Cuppison had problems with his vocal cords at that point. I think he might have. And I, he think totally, he might I think have. he totally lost his voice. It gone. Yeah. And this yeah. was the first time that he'd actually got his voice back. So he turned up on set, and everybody was aware of this, but he couldn't help himself. Yeah. He went for yeah. it. That's an no. amazing voice he has. You yeah, can see that Tom Baker, wonderful. you know, Tom Baker could be difficult, and he mm. loved working with Ian Cuffus. Yeah. Just, well, out. yeah, I mean, you can tell the two of them are so comfortable with each other and there's, a, you know, there's real electricity between them. But, I mean, as a story itself, the whole structure of the Key to Time series, I loved the idea. I think the, the overall execution could have been done better, yeah. but the actual whole, you know, segments of it, uh, it's... Great it idea. Really, I, could, they could really re- I think Doctor Who could revisit that whole concept. Oh, definitely. Easily. Well, Big Finish did. They've got a Key yeah. to time yeah. um I, I haven't actually heard any sort of yeah. comment but uh you know i would imagine they're all right um the white guardian the whole idea of the guardians is great you know cyril Wickham is just wonderful as a white guardian and him in the sequence where when he's explaining the whole idea of the quest to the doctor and the doctor suddenly goes well you know if i refuse what will happen cyril Wickham's guardian goes nothing tom baker what nothing 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 at all. Ever. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, you know, it's just that sort of the I mean yeah. it's not exactly subtle, subtle, but I mean, it's just brilliant because Tom's reaction. I watched say, Rybo's operation in the company of my friend Prentice Hancock. When I watched it with Prentice, Prentice, I think out of the four stories that he did, Prentice views that as his least impactful. He thought his character was a bit of a Kind of non entity, yeah. sort of, but actually, I said to him at the time, actually, you know, you're up against all this. The way that Prentice plays it, he plays it quite straight, and he's yeah. not a baddie, yeah. but he's a captain I'll... of the guard. And actually, and I'm not just saying this, but I, I think it's probably one of his stronger performances. And I mean, I love Planet of Evil and everything, and he's amazing in that. I was just but to say but that. He, he's so surrounded by these massive actors, I think his mm. choices are quite good in it. But yeah, no, he, he, he loved watching Ian Cuppers and he had all these stories about Ian Cuppers. He said he was very <laughs> naughty and he was, he, he was one of these guys that just could make you laugh. I would imagine he would just be pure entertainment. <laughs> That's a great story. I, I yeah. remember being uh, slightly disappointed the very first time I saw it because it had a really good reputation but then again I've sort of come at it without yeah, expectations yeah. again and just yeah. enjoyed it for what it is um, I think the graph sort of teeters a little on over the top and is it yeah, Shellac yeah. is his second yeah, in command yeah, number two. Do you, yeah. Do you, do you think it's Shellac Shellac yeah. yeah do you find that the graph and the protagonist in um, uh, Androids of Tara are very, very similar. I'll tell you when they get there. I yeah, well, there's that something to time. think about, but mm. that's another good one. There's I mean, my homework. I okay, anyway. well, that's Rebus Operation. I'm onto the Pirate Planet by my favourite author, Douglas yeah. Adams. And Brilliant. 
talk Absolutely about that brilliant. next time. Mm-hmm. One of the one of the good uh, target novelizations. That's a great one. That yeah, some of the of best the... target novels actually are the ones based in crap stories. Seriously. Yeah, I don't know why. Twin Dilemma is brilliant. Most room for improvement. It's a time lash, brilliant. It's a it's a similar thing with a lot of the DVDs now. I I quite like Invasion of Time. I think it's not a bad story. I understand there's problems with it, but the extras and the whole DVD package is woeful. Whereas the mutants, uh, the whole DVD package is amazing. Yeah, other right. than the story, which I've never managed to watch. Anyway, there you go, Tim. I've ma- managed to give you a really good lead in (laughs) i imagine that must be quite a challenge (laughs) okay so it's challenge time now (laughs) for several months uh, i have been waiting patiently for Chaz to watch the mutants basically the premise of this section of the show is that i've challenged Chaz to watch the mutants because he's never sat through it and then once he's watched that he can give me a challenge in turn and i'm i'm just desperate for a challenge mate i really want you to have done this so now, last last time, I think we you'd been to the special cinema release of the New Mutants, as they called it, which of course, I, yeah, I just the plot it and was so on differed was slightly yeah. from the original. So, what I'd ask you to do was to go and watch the old version. And did mm. you manage that? Well, seeing as you said the old version, what I did was I went to my video uh, rack and I actually got the mutants out the videotape, <laughs> and I had it. I put it into the little portable, and I thought, right. Switch the phone off, going to have a bit of relaxing time, sit and watch this, and finally I can get Tim off my back. Well, put it in, and I'd sort of just about press play when the doorbell went, and it turns out there's three guys at the doors. Three? Right? All, yeah, all dressed in, in black suits with briefcases, and I'm like, can I help you? <laughs> and they said, well, um, we are from the Disney Corporation. And I went, uh, right, and they asked to come in, and we sat down. And they said, basically, what it is that we had heard your recording last on your last podcast about <laughs> the New Mutants. As you know, that is a Disney property and is subject to copyright. And there is an allegation at the moment of copyright strikes regarding <laughs> the Doctor Who story. So we are here to issue you with a cease and desist notice <laughs> that you are not allowed to watch or mention so basically there's a court case pending with the with the house of the mouse and me and i have to take on the mouse but unfortunately i've had to in the meantime burn all copies of the mutants so i'm afraid tim that legally i'm not allowed to watch it at the moment okay okay never mind that did you say there were three guys at the door yeah have we got three more listeners fantastic Right, now let's be dead. It is time for Connor Spondence. So Chaz's son Connor has been sending us in hot takes and questions and ideas. So I have not read this yet, but um, he has sent us something which I will now read and then we can discuss. Modern Doctor Who's universe doesn't feel lived in enough because they have a monster problem. Okay. The Russell T. Davis era spent ages setting up different species with defined roles within the galaxy. But beyond the initial use, these species are rarely utilized. The majority of returning monsters in New Who are classic series monsters. Yet, in New Who, the only recurring monsters that have appeared more than twice are the Weeping Angels, the Ood, and the Jadun. There are plenty of monsters that should appear everywhere. For example, the cat nurses are established as alien medical workers. So why aren't they in Let's Kill Hitler or the Saranga conundrum? Why have the Reapers never reappeared? The Davis era spent time to set up roles in the universe, but unfortunately it's never been taken advantage of, especially in the Chibnall era an era that seems determined to never fulfill any form of potential. I've got the answer. Okay. Showrunner, showrunners decide. <laughs> that's the answer. Well, I mean, obviously, yeah, but that's, that is actually a genuinely good point. Because, I mean, classic Doctor Who spent years, yeah, we had the returning monsters, but we had so many stories with monsters that you might sort of, you know, maybe see once or twice, but you would have them here, there, and everywhere. It is, it is a sort of filled-out universe, and there have been so many sort of interesting monsters in New Who, but like you say, I mean, apart from things like, say, the Ragnos, and then we get something that is basically the same costume, the same look, everything, but deciding to call it something different, which still doesn't fucking compute. Pop, pop, maybe popularity, if something was so popular that it would... For instance, you talked about the Reaper. Um, hmm. I don't think you can bring them back, because if you do bring them back, 
um, you would just be retelling the same story. Possibly. There's not. What's the point of going back? Well, they're there to fix uh, problems in time. They're sort of uh, they're sort of reptilian uh, version of sapphire and steel. In a, in a <laughs> but, but don't you? But don't you think that the monsters that have made the return have made the return because they were popular? So the um, Judun has come back many times because they make the kids. Kids love them. What other ones came back, sorry, you said? Ood and the Weeping Angels. The Ood, brilliant. Yeah. Kids love the Ood and the Weeping Angels. Yep. What other ones do you want it Cat to say? Cat Nurses is Connor's yeah. suggestion. They'd be, they'd be background. They wouldn't be the story. Isn't that isn't that the good point? You know, I mean, if you've got what character, you know, like... Um, Face of Bo? Did the, Face of Bo? Well, he's dead now, but, you know, he has come back. I Arguably not a monster as well. Yeah, but my point being that, you know, like, uh, end of time when the Doctor goes to visit Jack in the bar, you know, and you get that sort of uh, yeah. Star Wars cantina I thing. That's all I hate that moment. It's terrible. I, I love because it. A lot, a lot of, why the fuck would a lot of those things be be in there. Put it this way, Ali. Have you not been in a pub and there's been loads of... Not different... for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I've well, seen Stranger loads... Creatures in corners of Glasgow pubs, mate. Exactly. You know, there's loads of different people for different backgrounds, races. I, did, I, I just got, oh, let's just go in the caution department and grab what we can and stick well, it Well, oh, you, could, you could argue the same with Pandorica. I mean, geez, that just looked like they basically raided the costume department. Rick's back at a bit of a monster fest. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah. I think my point of view, guys, is this: if there was one that was neglected and should have come back, I, I can't think of it. And the reason I can't think of it is because it didn't deserve to come back. The things that did come back deserve to come back, and the ones that didn't were one, one, one hit wonders anyway. So natural selection at work. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, we were talking about this the other night, weren't we? About the Whisper Men. I mean, the Whisper Men and the uh, name of the Doctor are. Creepy as hell, they are. They have great, great, great intelligence. They would they? Be, yeah. yeah, but they would be wonderful coming back because they're kind of like mercenaries of the great intelligence, same way that the Ogrons were for the Daleks. But if, if the intelligence came back, yeah, there's no reason why not. Get but there's, the there's no real reason why the Whispermen couldn't come back separately for the or great intelligence. I don't necessarily what I was saying is the same way the old runs are not just they don't just work for the Daleks. No, that's o- true. O- on screen that's what you see, but the old runs could be with with anybody in the same way I think with some Thing. The, si- the, the silence came back quite a lot, and I thought that was a good yeah, yeah. nobody remembered. I, I, know yeah. why the whis- I know why the Whisper Men didn't come back. It's because they're at the Monster Employment Exchange, and the big bads come in and say, Right, we're looking to hire some henchmen. Speak up now if you want to be hired. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. I think there's an interesting debate there because back in the day in the old show, the Cybermen came back almost straight away, didn't they? And they were yeah. more or less in the same story. They remade the 10th planet. It was just moon based. Kids loved the Cybermen. <laughs> the BBC loved the Cybermen because they needed something to replace the Daleks because Terry Nation was taking them away. Ice Warriors came back. Um, mm. The Master came back. So there's a reason. Yeah, they're so popular, really. And, and it gives you such a thrill. I think one of the greatest thrills I've ever had in Doctor Who was um, when, when the Master was revealed in Keeper of Tracking. I watched that with my mum. And I turned around and goes, Mum, I told you, it's the master. I told you, Mum. And my mum went, when's this going to be finished? I want to know. <laughs> in those days, we only, we only had the one telly. And she was like, when's it going to be finished? You've got a video recorder now, Alistair. I know, but I don't trust you. You're recording it. And you're also watching it live. Yeah, I remember those days. Oh, oh my. But, I think there's maybe a practical reason as well that for maybe, you know, if the monster's popular, bring it back, sure. Yeah. But to do it casually, you need to pay the author. Um, that's which, true yeah copy, the copy, copy, copyright. copyright yeah and not not just that i mean say it's like the cat nuns or, or something and they've only made say about normally four costumes whereas if you've got daleks you've got you know at least half a dozen on standby so as budgetary reasons i would imagine lots of other like, copyright things but i agree that it is nice to see like um characters that are not necessarily that you know like uh, massive to the plot but you recognize the species or something 
you know, going on. It gives it a world building feel, yeah. and that's that's always a good thing. You know, it's like Star Trek does that a lot. You know, they have Andorians in the background, or they have some other species in the background, but they don't necessarily mean that they're going to be involved in the plot. Well, fun so, and games in you know, Revolution of the Daleks with the other creatures in the prison. The argument for bringing them back, of course, is you can reuse the costume and save a bit of money that way. So, yeah. well, exactly. I mean, that's why they were they reused every costume in the wardrobe in uh, Pandorico. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Connor, for your correspondence and um, provoked an interesting discussion, I hope. Predictable as ever, Doctor. 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 Now it's time for Doctor by Doctor, where we randomly select a doctor <laughs> and talk about their era. However, after thinking it was the end last week and the moment I hadn't been prepared for, it is now actually our last doctor. So the only doctor left in the box of docs is number nine, Chris Freckleson. So let's wow. imagine we've plucked it out and are very surprised. The man who brought wow. Doctor Who back. What do we wow. think about Chris well, Freckleson? I got uh, a phone call from our mate John Isles. And um, he basically told me that Eccleson had been cast, and I saw it punching the air going, this is amazing. And we was on the phone for about an hour, you know, talking about it. So I was really excited by this because you didn't at that time expect it to be such a high-profile actor and someone who was sort of known for doing a lot more serious stuff. Yeah. And it kind of signaled to me that they were, although they were obviously still going to have fun with it, that they were taking it seriously. You know, it really did feel like a, a big deal. Yeah, it was a big deal. We had just watched um, Second Coming. Yeah, when he plays Jesus. Oh, was that Russell uh, T. Davis as well? That was Russell, and it was Russell T. Davis. And then, of course... I knew that Russell T. Davis was a fan, and and yeah. then of course they brought it back, and um, so I wasn't that surprised that he cast him. What surprised me was I thought, how could somebody like him, working class type guy, be the Doctor? Because for me, the Doctor was always this kind of posh, upper class person, not not McCoy maybe, but the rest. Mm. And then I couldn't get my head around that, and I thought, what are they going to do with this show? What are they going to do? He was the first working class Doctor. That's what Eccleston himself said because he was always playing football. He said, but I didn't relate to the RP thing of no. they all spoke. They, none of them spoke like me, you know, and they said no. it kind of alienated it a little bit. That's hence why the costume is so. It's subdued. It's basically a, a leather jacket. I mean, the line in Unquiet Dead when Charles Dickens says, You look like a navvy, you know, <laughs> it's, it's quite amusing. And I remember when the photographs were released or whatever, everybody said, Oh, that must be them just reading the script. That can't be his yeah. costume. Yeah. But I was quite fascinated and really liked it. And I liked that down to earth approach, you know. He was a doctor who was suffering from PTSD. A lot, yeah. and it, you could see the agony in his eyes, and I think yeah. somebody like when well, you're an actor like Eccleston can portray that really well. I mean, in the episode with the Dalek, you know, that's a particularly good piece of you know piece of work between the you know him and the Dalek because you don't tend to get that in old series. You know, like the Dalek, you would kind of cut the Dalek dialogue to a minimum, but there was a lot of back and forth. And, you know, throughout most of the series, he really sold the character. I mean, in the introduction, they made that great uh, way of introducing him, not with Rose, but basically when when she is in danger and then suddenly he's there and they don't make a big deal of it. Bum, 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 the doctor's back. It's basically just he's there, run. That sort of sums it up. You know, that sums up a lot of the Eccleston era. He's there. And he's, you know, he's immediately in charge. The Eccleston Doctor, I always felt he was a, a doctor that really couldn't wait just to die. That he did not enjoy being that doctor. Yeah. he That, that persona of pain. Yeah. That, that was not the doctor that we all know and love. That the doctor as a character, that was just, that pain was just too much. Mm. And it was a bit a bit like Capaldi saying, I don't want to be another, I, don't, I can't go through it again. The Ninth Doctor's persona his life that the doc it was a real relief when he mm. went it was almost like the doctor knew this isn't me i'm not, yeah. this is not me 
that this pain I can't deal with, and he becomes tenant who deals with the pain a lot better and becomes more the doctor, more confident. But yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I think basically Eccleston's doctor is suffering from survivor's guilt. You know, he's yeah. he survived when everybody yeah. died the same yeah. way that when people are on airplanes that crash, you know, where most of the people die, they you know they it affects them. The best and, thing that happened to him was meeting Rose because it gave yeah. him the chance not to think about it. Yeah, he could distract himself. And also he's on that journey, you know, because he's kind of learning compassion again, learning sort of, you know, what it is to, to live again through Rose. He was like a like a firework. It just went boom. Yeah. yeah. Exploded. Yeah. And then but, he then, but I thought, I always felt that was a lovely way to play it. There was pain, pain, pain. Mm-hmm. And, when he, and when he said it was fantastic, I don't believe him. I think mm. he was relieved to go. I, th- I think he could well be right. He burned the brightest, and uh, but he was the most undoctorish mm-hmm. of all the actors who've played it. I think slightly, but I think what it was, he was playing like, the way John Hurt did it. He was playing a you know a different aspect to the Doctor, but he his Doctor throughout that entire season, you could see him becoming the Doctor. You know, he was on that journey towards the end where, you know, he sort of decides that he's not going to blow up, you know, the Daleks because it will blow up the Earth as well and things. You know, he's he's a lot more the way the Doctor is, more of a pacifist because, I mean, when his first initial meeting with the Dalek is to get a gun, which is so undoctor like I mean, I'm not saying that the Doctor's never had a gun, but he is very much... And that sort of the compassion has gone. Yeah. It's literally only just struck me that actually the episode Dalek has it's got even more weight when you mm. know more of the time war. Yeah. And, and it's literally he's faced with that. He did all of that for nothing. And it's a lovely bit of kind of completist join the dots when you get to Day of the Doctor. Absolutely. And Hurt turns into Eccleston. And um, mm. it's, uh, yeah, just that, that kind of trajectory is so, so rich. You know, there's so much to enjoy on repeated viewings. I think I, I knew Eccleston from Cracker. Um, I loved oh, his yeah. performance in yeah. Cracker. His famous and, death scene. <laughs> yeah. And um, I've been delighted with the casting because the thing that's always slightly bugged me is all the kind of gossipy stuff about who will the new Doctor be. It's always comic actors. Yeah. And, and not that they can't be fantastic, as we've talked about, but it says something of how the program is perceived. The character is perceived as silly. Yeah. that That's actually a point that RTD made at the time. He said that he's so pissed off when they do the cat. Well, they announce, yeah, they said that, you know, Paul Daniels is being considered yeah. and pish like that. He said, this is one of the best roles in television. And Russell T. Davis changed that perception yeah. forever. You want to get one of the best actors, so... That's one of the know. things that that's one of the things that worries me just now is that that, that, that perception has been totally destroyed by, um, by the current... Oh, I don't think it is. Yeah, I know what you mean. I it's don't still a dramatic a, role. No, yeah, but... I still... You know, no, no, I don't. I, I, but I think people's perception of Doctor Who has gone back to yeah. you know, laughing at it a little bit, mm. dismissing it. Very, very possibly. Very possibly. Maybe the people you're hanging around with. <laughs> <laughs> Us. <laughs> Well, let's talk, uh, let's uh, talk about Eccleston's yeah. the sort of one season of glory because mm. I know it was quite an early decision in the process that he wouldn't do a second season, but presumably he took the role up with the possibility of doing multiple yeah. seasons. I, yeah, I, I believe so. so, yeah. Do is, is he, um, isn't he about to do a big finish? Oh, yeah. He's, yes. uh, I have a lot of faith in that because the writers there uh, take a lot of care, especially when they get like somebody new and, you know, they want to... Yeah. You know, like give them really good things to work with. So I think he'll develop his doctor. I'm excited for it. How does that work though? Because in the real Doctor Who universe, his doctor didn't develop. Sort of when does that work? Where do you slot it in? You can't mellow him too much or it ruins the end of I think if you if you look at it, there's a gap in between the bad wolf episode and uh, the episode before because everybody's been taken out of the TARDIS. The doctor said they'd just been in Japan in Kyoto. Load of stories you can sit in there. He's obviously had some adventures 
previous to those because apparently it was in Sumatra yeah. and so on. So you've got that, and I think it's more uh, you'll be able to develop it in terms of looking at his pain and how he's attempting yeah. to handle it yeah. rather than say... He's not going to become a jolly doctor, is he? I don't he's think he's so. always I think... going to be full of angst. What's your least favourite Ninth Doctor story and why? My least favourite is his final story. In some ways, maybe it was more to do with I didn't want his doctor to go. His leaving was just kind of tacked on for me. Didn't have the gravitas it deserved. I think I would say I'm quite dead. And I don't mean that in a bad way because it is actually quite a good story. But I find that actually the weakest one is the most traditional Doctor Who story. Did you say that your least favourite was Father's Day? Yeah, it's the it's soap my, opera that, thing. That's my that's my favourite. <laughs> well, we've talked before on the podcast about my taste is less for the kind of soap opera kind of families kind of stuff. I mean, it's you know, it's all very well done. That's not why I love it. I love it. I love it because I love the I love the the Grim Reaper, the Reapers, the Reapers. Right. Sean Dingwell is one of the greatest characters in Doctor Who ever. I didn't but like him. I, I, I had never felt that kind of emotion mm -hmm. watching Doctor Who. I'd never seen a Doctor Who story like it yeah. up to that point ever. I, I love it, you know. But... No, it's definitely got its merits. Just one mm -hmm. of them had to be last. Did you think that Rose worked better in her relationship with the Ninth Doctor, or do you think she worked better in her relationship with the Tenth? Ninth. Probably probably the ninth. I I I like Billy Piper, I like the character of Rose and you know, I liked her in ten, but I could see that they were kind of making it a little bit like she was obsessed. I've never had a problem with the idea of new series the way they sort of I don't mean sexualize the doctor, but the you know, he's the handsome hero, as it were. I'm not that interested. That's I suppose the only soap opera element that was introduced that I just thought, oh. but again, it did make it realistic because if I was traveling with the doctor, for example, right, and you've got, you know, all these things that show you planets, whatever, I would fall in love with him. Most people would, you know? So it's natural, but I don't know, in the narrative or the sort of the way of the entertainment of the show, it sometimes can get in the way. I actually think, thinking about Robert Holmes and his penchant for the double act, I actually think his relationship with Jackie was the most interesting dynamic yeah. about his yeah, doctor. Yeah. And yeah. I think if she'd become his companion, I think it would have been much more interesting. One more element of the Eccleston era. Remember when the whole bad wolf thing was new and it was a puzzle mm. and the whole idea of a series arc was unheard of in Doctor Who keep the time notwithstanding but how glorious and enjoyable was that spotting the bad wolves I thought that was one of the most exciting things you know what you say seeding the you know the what was going to happen and the fact that they kept bringing it back every now and again was wonderful. Bad wolf everywhere, you know, sort of little sightings. Connor and I went to uh, to Spain, I think it was about six months after the season, and uh, we were on this sort of deserted beach, and I got a bit of uh, rock and chalk. <laughs> we wrote bad wolf, and I've still got that photograph of me and Connor. <laughs> Because, you know, that whole thing in drama of sometimes you're behind the characters and sometimes you're with them and sometimes you're narratively ahead of them. Well, we were mm. ahead of them all season. And then the moment mm. in Boomtown where he goes, Blythe Droog, that means bad wolf. Bad wolf. It's been the shivers. Yeah. That was Blythe just electric. Droog. Yeah. Uh, Eccleston was fantastic. And the shame that he only had the one series, but it's also kind of like one golden firework. Yeah, like it said. really is. It's sort of like a perfect little gift. Well, I look and forward to these big finishes. I immediately ordered them because it was like, I really <laughs> want to see this. Thank you to Ali for joining us. We will look forward to hearing what you think about Vengeance on Varos. Send us it in by post. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you for inviting me. It's amazing. It's uh, so different, actually been part of it then <laughs> enjoy listening to it it's going to sound very weird to listen to it yeah could it have been affected by tangential deviation coming out of the warp limbs and hopefully some sex what are you talking about grease dame ali's had to leave us but we're going to finish off the episode by talking about our tangents <laughs> we've watched red dwarf and slowed down a little bit we've watched season seven because season seven was longer than usual i think was it eight yeah. episodes instead of six yeah yeah and this is an interesting one so Chris Barry sort of left, but sort of didn't. Um, yeah. Rimmer sort of uh, was in fewer episodes, not all of them, but kind of made guest or flashback appearances in a few, and the character was written out. But um, it was a short-lived departure. And I, I suppose a way of shot in the arm. And kind of in his place, 
came uh, Chloe Annett as Kachansky, um, yeah. nipping across from a nearby parallel dimension to join the gang. And that really did shake things up. So it's a lumpy season. It's, there's some real oddities in it, but I think there's yeah. a, a lot of interest. So I'll just dig out the episodes and why don't oh, we oh, sure. just uh, pick a favourite again like we've been doing. Ticket to Ride, Stoke mm. Me a Clipper, A Roboros, Duck Soup, Blue, Beyond the Joke, Epideme, and Nanarchy. So eight episodes. You got a, a clear favourite out of that lot? I would say Duct Soup. Mm, I like that one too. Yeah. Why do you like that I mean, so much? But the, well, again, it sort of speaks to that old school thing, me and Red Dwarf. I mean, I actually enjoyed this season immensely. Um, I think the only one that's a little bit mm, is Tika to Ride. Duck Soup is that classic, you know, they're stuck in a particular place and it's all conversations. Character. Yeah. Uh, again, another sort of waiting for God or porridge type thing, but it, it builds the characters. It's very, very funny. You know, there's some great little jokes in it. And, and it, you're in the reach. Yeah. I mean, level Chloe and it really sort of, you know, she really establishes herself as incredibly funny and all the little jokes about, you know, I never thought I'd end up in a spaceship with the height of entertainment as you two sitting in the laundry room watching my knickers go round and round. <laughs> It's so stupid, but, you know, and this whole bit she does of it, you know, I was always popular. I, I grew up in the most uh, posh part of Glasgow, the Gorbals. No, that's a strange joke. <laughs> it's so brilliant. I mean, it's so, uh, you know, if you live in Scotland, you would know the Gorbals have possibly improved a lot, but I, I wouldn't say they're the poshest part of Glasgow. Well, by the 24th century, who knows? Um, yeah, well, true. There's a Gentrification. couple of production oddities here, which mm. I think really make a difference as you watch them now. So Ticket to Ride and I think Duck Soup as well, yeah. as they exist on sort of services like Netflix and so on, don't have a laugh track. And I believe yeah. that's because what we're watching is a slightly extended version. We read yeah. up on this and there's an ex a whole extra scene at the end of Ticket to Ride, um, which is weird and it kills uh, it, especially I, Ticket to Ride. I totally agree with that, I think. You know, I mean, Ticket to Ride, as I say, I don't think it's the best one. It was very clever and it was a good, you know, it was more dramatic. Timey wimey plot. Yeah. But uh, as you say, that scene at the end just wastes it yeah. you know for whatever reason plus it's i don't mind any sort of comedy without a laugh track but if you're so used to a laugh track to take it away feels very very strange yeah you know? and i believe they were filmed up until this season with an audience a live audience and mm -hmm. then this was a laugh track and they were, you know, Ticket to Ride and the other one were both recorded with a laugh track and released mm. with a laugh track. It's just that's not the version that's out there. Yeah. No. And it really, it means they're pausing for laughs that don't happen and it feels I so I know, odd. that's why it feels weird. But they say a line and then they wait and there's nothing. And it, it just, it's so weird. It's like whenever mm. I tell a joke. Case in point. And there we go. <laughs> so yeah, Duck Soup's a great episode. I'm going to see if I can pick a different one. Um, mm. Well, Stoke Me a Clipper is historic, if you like, because um, Ace comes back and hands the mantle of Aceness on to Arnold. I, mean, I like that in the introductory bit, riding a crocodile. <laughs> in fact, that it's is so my favourite. so stupidly over the top. Yeah, of, the rest of it is okay. Yeah. But I think I'm that's it. This season has got lots of, it. it's got lots of amazing scenes, yeah. but there's no episodes which are kind of really strong it's all like, the way through. You know, it's like blue, you know, when they're in the, the whole uh, rimmer world, rimmer thing, world that's, thing, that's great. But up until then, it's, it's okay again. It's well, like, no, that one's got, I think yeah. my favourite scene in that is the sort of dream sequence where Rimmer comes oh, back yeah, and they yeah, kiss. I mean, and Jesus, it's like, that's, that's hilarious. Because you're watching it and you're going, what is happening? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know, because it, it's subtle at first, and then you yeah. say, oh, my God. It's well picked. Yeah, it's, it's actually, that is a, is a great scene, you know. It's, um, yeah, I, I think the start of Stormy Clipper, you're right, that, that steals the whole season, I think, <laughs> just that pre-titles. <laughs> and hopefully some sex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. No, I don't have a clear favourite. Probably would be Duck Soup as well. There's yeah. some great moments throughout. Chloe Ann think, is fantastic as well, yeah. just a really good addition to the team. I think, um, I think the last two are, are particularly good especially the plot because the mm. way they devised in the last episode about wrapping up the the, the hunt for red dwarf and what happened and blah, got blah, hunt blah. for red october hunt for red dwarf. yeah but i mean it's it's very clever plotting and 
in the next season, I just like because um, the nanobots have rebuilt Red Dwarf, but they've done it to the original <laughs> spec. Yeah. That is such a, so a an anal thing about explaining why it looks slightly different. Other, you know, you don't even need to put that in. But it was just, it's like a Moffat thing where there's a, an inconsistency and he basically makes up a, a techno babble type line that will explain it away. Red Dwarf's done it a couple of times because mm. originally 169 in the crew, uh, of which Lister ranked 169 famously, but then that got upgraded. There were thousands uh, or more than a thousand. I think it's sort of the novels did some of that as well. They expanded the ship yeah. world a lot. But then oh, Kachansky, yeah, his relationship with Kachansky was, um, you know, that in the complete... original series... They yeah. never went out. And then by the time we get to meet Chloe Annitz Kachansky, the history yeah. of the show is that they did date for a while. Yeah, I mean, that that was obviously complete uh, sort of retcon, I suppose. I'm not but... sure if there's any kind of in-world retcon of it. Yeah. It's all fun. And, you know, like like we often say, you don't want any of that to get in the way of it. I genuinely, yeah. I mean, I genuinely think when you're watching something, let's like, say, Doctor Who or Star Trek, you want it to kind of make some sense but when you're watching Red Dwarf, I rather they concentrate on the comedy. That's why when we watched Promised Land, it just felt a bit off. I think I mentioned yeah. this last time because you know I, they were, you know, they were telling a good story and it was interesting, but it wasn't as funny as it could have been. Yeah, it's a bit too dramatic. Mm. How dare they? Now, interesting. We've enjoyed season seven. We're looking forward to season eight, where we have back Red Dwarf itself. What's happening? You're becoming one of us. So our other tangent that we've been exploring is the strangely terrible but wonderful Tomorrow People. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we've since yeah. since last recording we've yeah. watched the second sort of story within the first season, which is called the Medusa Strain, and it was a bit of a strain, but oh, um, yeah. I'm still having fun. So tell us about this one, Jazz. Ah, uh, plot. Okay. Uh, well, that based... didn't take long. Oh, there you go. Uh, there's some sort of. Uh, bugger up with hyperspace uh, they jaunt into hyperspace to see it the robot Jedekiah from the previous story has managed to hitch a lift on this not liberator starship and um, the starship is popularized by um, a sort of fat bloke in a sort of admiral's costume who collects sort of ephemera from sort of old stuff history Got a good he collection has of like a, medieval weapons yeah. and whatnot. He has a telepath from the future in a sort of prison, and he has a sort of robot servant played by Dave Prowse, who's basically he's had someone spray him silver, put plasters over his nipples, and gave him a thong. Basically, tomorrow people find us the they sort of try and rescue the kids, stop the villain from plundering Earth's history treasures, uh, managed to bugger it up, and the crown jewels get stolen and destroyed. So I can only imagine that from then on it was costume jewellery that was on display. Yeah. You know. Um, there's this Medusa creature, which... Oh, is yeah, Jesus. Yeah, the Medusa. Fucking hell, the Medusa thing, which basically... Yeah, it blocks telepathy. And it, it changes feeds size. on telepaths, doesn't it? And then it, it, in one of the later episodes, it's seen trundling down a corridor, which reminded me of the the low point of Invisible Enemy with the space Yeah, it, it kind of looks the like they put it on a skateboard. Or you see it sort of wobbling <laughs> as the person inside it's probably on a trike or something like a Dalek. So, so terrible. So it's really... Um, yeah. I wow. mean, the, the episode rattles along quite nicely. You Much know, like the Medusa. Yeah, it's a bit silly. Um, and as always, Kenny gets left in the lab, thankfully. It's like it's, it's not, they're not even trying to hide it now. They're like, no, Kenny, you stay here. Yeah, not no. you, Kenny. Oh, geez. Well, uh, nothing much improves, basically. You know, well, so. the big revelation for me this time was that Carol had about 30 seconds of oh, decent yeah. acting. Yeah, um, that was a shock. I know, it was just like, it was so out of character. And it's it's a sort of drop in the ocean of otherwise her usual kind of... <laughs> which is kind of all I hear. Oh, I'm being <laughs> terribly cruel. Tim, the computer, has the character development of a 
dead pig. Um, yeah. I mean, he's a computer, so you wouldn't expect I mean, much. Tim actually gets a lot more character development because he has got a personality. I'll well, tell you who else I'm enjoying is um, Ginge. Yeah! Now he's one of the, the best gang actor, isn't it? come around from being a henchman. We do notice that Lefty's uh, not there anymore, thankfully. because He's gone into obviously. politics. I would say that the, I mean, the villain who plays, the guy who plays Jedekiah is different from the last story. Yeah, that's he weird. He was played by Francis de Wolf, who was um, very much a, a hammer uh, actor and stuff. So he's quite dramatic and he was very good. But this actor, I, I don't know, I think he's actually too bad. Um, he's, it's a good, it's a pretty good performance. But uh, I mean, if you were given it sort of like, no, points out of ten, I'd probably give it about a one or something. I mean, it's <laughs> it's pretty abysmal, but I, I mean, uh, there's a lot of them that would get a one, but that doesn't mean in any way that I dislike it. I mean, I, I love it despite uh, the myriad of faults that it has. You've told you know, me there are better stories to come, so I'm looking oh, forward yeah, to that. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's of a two oh, out of ten, God, Doomsday Weapon, um, the blue and the green, you know, there's some, there are some genuinely good What's the uh, next one called? Vanished Earth? Is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's actually quite a good one. Cool. Um, Stay tuned. If you can get past the, the Chloe Cox clan outfit. What? Oh, my. <laughs> oh, this just keeps on giving this show. It really does. It really does. Yeah. It but really Dave Prowse has, um, you know, stomps about very imposingly. Of course, this is mm. the actor who went on to play Darth Vader. But at that point, I think he'd just been the Green Cross Code Man. Um, yeah, well, this was 19... The series started in 1973. So this would say be either late 73, 74. So mm. we're well before... Star Wars at this point. I mean, you wonder what George Lucas saw of his work. That well, <laughs> you know I mean? Posing yeah. pouch. <laughs> kind of a small tangent about the, the nipples and stuff. Uh, it's, uh, There's our episode title. <laughs> <laughs> a small tangent about the nipples. Perfect. In Star Wars, uh, George Lucas insisted that Carrie Fisher didn't wear a, a bra. Oh, yeah, I've heard and the he story. Said, yeah. yeah, and he said because, you know, no one wears under, underwear in space, but she had to have tape on her nipples as well. So, you know, her and Dave Prowse probably had stories to swap. Yeah, they could share sure war that, stories. I'm, I'm sure the hours just flew by. <laughs> I, was, I was quite sad when uh, Dave Prowse's character was unceremoniously zapped yeah. towards the end. But... Oh, and of course, he got knocked in the head. He was he was pre- oh, yes. doing a another Star Wars thing. Star Wars. <laughs> the cage that some uh, one of the kids is in, it comes up, Dave Prowse grabbing it, and then the cage comes down slightly too quickly and you just see it hit him on the head. Yeah. And he's, he, he jerks back. Doesn't so. miss a beat, whatever the professional. Nope. Another lumpy episode, but um, good fun. I think it's a step up from the first one although yeah. you know like uh, a tiny doll's house step rather than <laughs> I think else. I think the first one suffers from that whole existing you know <laughs> yeah well it's it's that whole of escape capture escape capture mm. although this one is still doing similar but because Steven's character hasn't been established you've got a lot of setting up to yeah. do in that story, whereas you you kind of know them now. I mean, they're yeah. very thinly veiled characters anyway, so there's not uh, a lot to know. But at least we can go on with the plot. I wish we did. What it is? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can get on with the plot. But, yeah, uh, enjoying plot? it tremendously, and more will come. It's the end, but the moment has been prepared for. Nine times out of ten. Thank you very much for listening. That has been the Randomizer Podcast, episode 15. Thank you to Ali for joining us. That's and been epic. It has. Uh, we thought last time was long. We'll see how long this ends up. But if you have any questions, feedback, or comments, or if you have found yourself unexpectedly in hyperspace, then we can be reached at randomizerpodcast at gmail.com. And you can reach us on at randomizerpod. And in both cases, that's with an S. Not a Z. I bug it out. <laughs> I know, but you're always doing it, space, and I love you for it. <sighs> Bravo. <sighs> <sighs>
when I when I rewatched it when I rewatched it with Fenty, <laughs> when I re- oh, Al, can you let me do that bit again because the, the punch, I was just about to say the punch. Well, let's go, let's go back, let's go back. 